21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Oh, where's this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, do you need an ambulance there? Well, which car is involved and who's hurt? You are in the muster room at the well, 21st Precinct, the nerve down. center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right, there's an ambulance on the way. I heard the radio call. That's right. It's all taken care of. Okay, I'll make the notification. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my night tour. When I came into the station house at 3.25 p.m., I signed the blotter and went directly into my office where I changed to uniform. Then I sat down at my desk to sift through the volume of reports and communications that had accumulated since I was last on duty nearly 24 hours earlier. At two minutes before four, I walked out into the muster room where I went behind the desk and turned out the platoon for the 4 to 12 tour. After the 63 men who would patrol the streets of the precinct on foot and in sector cars marched out the front door of the station house to take over their posts, I returned to my office for a conference with the precinct youth patrolman in regard to the problems he would face with the reopening of the schools a couple of weeks hence. He outlined his program for the fall, and I gave my approval to his plans. At 5.30 p.m., I went on patrol of the precinct in sector car number two, with patrolman Paul Egan as operator and myself as recorder. During the course of this patrol, I had occasion to make a stop at a movie house on Lexington Avenue in regard to several complaints we had received. I found the manager in the back of the theater and spoke to him there while the newsreel was playing on the screen. Captain, believe me, I don't want a rowdies in here. I wish they wouldn't show up. Well, they're certainly beginning to scare your regular patrons away. You're telling me. Here, here's the, the part of the newsreel I was telling you about. A flat look from Paris. <laughs> how do you... How do you like those new styles? That's a scream, isn't it? Yeah. Pencil figure, they call it. It's a shame there isn't more people here to enjoy it. Well, there'll be even more of them stay away, Mr. Sokin, if you can't keep the disturbances down in here. Well, what can I do? They seem like nice, clean kids when they buy their tickets at the box office. They get in here, they start making a lot of noise and disturbing the patrons. There's usually five or six of them in a lump. I got myself and one usher. I try to calm them down, but there's some odds we're against. Well, just call the station house, Mr. Sogan. We'll get them quiet or out or both. Well, that's something I'd like to avoid, Captain. You know, cops coming in here. That don't look good, a situation like that. Doesn't look very good now, does it? <laughs> you got a big point, Captain. Big point. I'll take your advice. Is, uh, is that cop looking for you? Oh, yes. Egan, here. Well, Captain, the call just came over. Alarm of a fire at 83rd Street and 1st Avenue. All right, Egan. Uh, keep in touch with us if you need us, Mr. Sokin. I will, Captain, I will. You can depend on it. I hope so. Well, I'll see you, Captain. See you. Okay, what's burning there, Egan? Do you know? The call didn't say, Captain. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Oh, uh, was the call put out? Ambulance responding? No, sir. All right, we'll take a look. Yes, sir. Oh, get in, Captain. I'll go around. Right. I hope it's not a dwelling there. Well, if it's bad, they'll hit the second alarm. Okay, go ahead. You're clear. Cut over and go up first. There'll be less traffic. Yes, sir. This looks clear. Okay, take it. Watch it. 
Watch that car. Get out of the way. Hold on, Captain. Egan. Egan. Officer. Are you all right in there? Officer. Egan. Officer. Look, can you open that door, lady? The, this one's jammed. I'm trying to. I'll, I'll push from the inside and we'll, we'll try together. All right. Uh, all right. Together. Uh, it won't work. There it goes. Oh, are you all right? Egan. Oh. Oh, my goodness. Hey, is anybody hurt? You all right? All right, you, you folks better stay back. Oh, oh, that poor man. All right, just just stand back a little. You weren't driving that car, were you? No. No, he's in there. He's still sitting in there. Uh, how is he? I don't know. All right, stand back, folks. Is, is he going to be all right, do you think? Just, just give us a little room here, huh? Come on, there. Give him a little room. Car 681 to Central. K... Car 681 at 78th Street and Lexington Avenue. We were struck by another car while responding to the alarm of a fire. K. Anyone engine, car 681. K. The operator was injured and possibly the driver of the other car. K. Are you all right? You don't look so good. Oh, I'll be all right. You want to get out? Yeah, I'll, I'll get out. Just a second. Egan. Look, uh, will one of you people grab hold of my hand? I've, I've got to climb Please, over some it. Some of you men, help them. Don't stand there. Okay, lady. Come on, sir. I got you. Come on. Easy. Easy now. Uh, are you all right? Yeah, I'm okay. But you're sure now. I'm all right. Egan. Oh, my goodness. Can I do something for him? What can I do? Well, the ambulance will be here right away. You better just let him stay there. Such a nice-looking young man. If he comes around, will you let me know? I want to talk to the driver of the other oh, car. Oh, yeah. But you're sure you're all right now. You don't look so good. Yes, I'm all right. Are you hurt? No, I... I don't think so. I'm just a little bit shaken up, that's all. I think... What's your name? Creedy. Joseph L. Creedy. Where do you live? 33 West 79th Street. You're supposed to pull over when you hear a siren. What? You're supposed to pull over and stop when you hear a siren. I didn't hear it. I I'm sorry. Well, you were right on top of it. I, I didn't hear it. Didn't you see the police car making the turn? Yes, I saw it, but it was too late. I, I, I tried to stop. It was just too late. Is, is the other policeman hurt? It looks like he's hurt, yes. Oh, that's too bad. That's that's very bad. There's an ambulance on the way. Were you heading home? Yes, about 11 years. I asked you if you were heading home. Oh, I'm sorry. I misunderstood you. I thought you asked it. I've been driving long. No, I, I, was, I was going to pick up a friend of mine. We were uh, going out to dinner. Oh. She lives on East 66th Street. Have you had anything to drink, Mr. Creedy? Oh, no, I haven't had a thing to drink. Nothing. I, I, I don't drink much. All right, you stay right here. What'd you say, sir? I said you stay right here. Stay in your car. Yes, all right. I, I hope he's not hurt bad. Uh, so do I. Well, there, there's some more policemen. Yes, I know. I'm sorry. I, I'm really awfully sorry. All right, all right. You just sit here. Yes, I will. Captain. Captain, are you all right? Yes, Mercado, I think so. The ambulance is on the way. Egan is hurt. Sergeant, did you take a look at Egan? Okay. He's hurt pretty bad. Must have hit up against the wheel. What happened, sir? Well, we were responding to the alarm of a fire, siren open. Egan was making a turn into this street. This fellow didn't stop. He hit us broadside and knocked us against the light pole. Are you sure you're all right? Yeah, yeah. I got a little bump on the head, but uh, I don't think it's anything. Well, what is he, drunk or something? Well, he claims he hasn't had a thing to drink. He was on his way to pick up a friend. Claims he didn't hear the siren. His car's a mess. He's not hurt, is he? No. I, are you sure you're all right, Captain? I'm okay. Let's go over there. Yes, sir. Boy, it'll be a long time before this car's back in service. All right, come on. Let's screw there, will you? Let's screw. Let's move. There's nothing to see here. Give him a little air, huh? 
Did he come around, Sergeant? No, sir, he didn't. All right, move along. Are you all right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, Mercado, would you reach in there and get my cap for me? Yes, sir. Egan. Egan. Here you are, Captain. Nice. Mercado, get those people back on the sidewalk. Yes, sir. All right, folks. Come on, let's go. Let's get back. Come on, get, get the man in the air. He just on, rammed into us. If he didn't hear us, he should have seen us. Egan's not breathing very heavy. No. But he's breathing. Would you go to the call box there, Sergeant? Yes, sir. Ring the desk officer and tell him what we've got. Yes, sir. Right away, Captain. Mercado. Yes, sir. Get ready to give him a hand. Right, sir. Hey, do you think he's going to be all right? Yes, I hope so. So do I. But he doesn't look very good to me. Not very good at all. Now, look, you better stand back up on the sidewalk, oh, lady. Uh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize. Yeah, just, just stand up. All right, all right. Come on, now. Let's have a little room in there. Little room. All right. All right, open up right there, huh? Hello, Captain. Hello, Doctor. Well, let's have a look at him. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. What's it look like, Doctor? It's hard to tell a thing here. All right, let's put him on. You want me to get him on his feet? Let's take him out head first, all right? Or however you want it. You. You grab his feet as he comes out. Yes, sir. Okay, I'll do that. All right, officer. Easy with him now. Easy. I've, I've got him. Easy now. Up. Up. I right, get his feet. Don't let him fall. Okay, Doc. Okay, I got him. All right, put him on. Put him on now. That's it. Easy. All right, now up into the ambulance, huh? Come on. I got this end. Okay. Grab that end down there, will you? That's it. Easy with him. Doctor, uh, I want you to take a look at the driver of the other car. There? Yeah, he says he's all right. Oh, I'll look at him. Come on, easy there. Take Thanks, it. Doctor. I rang it, Captain. Good, sir. Uh, excuse me, Captain. Yes? You want the other driver to go to the hospital? Well, if you think he should. All right, I'll have a look at him. What do you say about Egan? He can't tell a thing yet. Oh? Did you tell the desk officer what we've got? Yes, sir. And he told me something, too. What? The fire you were responding to, Captain. Yeah? It was a false alarm. You are listening to 21st Precinct a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. You have a horrible feeling that something is wrong when the radio goes dead. You turn on the television set. Nothing there, either. You walk out on the street to look for your newspaper, but it isn't on your porch, your front lawn. No place. And then you notice the silence all around you. No voices, not a one. The theater lights are off. The public auditorium is boarded up. You're frightened. You don't know what's wrong. I'll tell you what's wrong. You've just found out what it would be like to live under a system of government that controls the freedom of speech. There are such systems in the world today. But a group of men took care that it wouldn't happen to you. They did their work 165 years ago when they wrote the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. In the first article of those 10 original amendments, they said, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Those men, men like Franklin and Jefferson, made it official, made it a law. Every time we have our say in public or in private, we're exercising that law. And exercise is good. If someone else doesn't like what we say, he's entitled to his own opinion, and he's entitled to voice it just as loudly and clearly as he wants. That's guaranteed by our Constitution, by our Bill of Rights. Freedom of speech... It's one of our freedoms. Now back to 21st Precinct and Captain Kennelly. In any calendar year, there are more than 78,000 fire alarms in the city of New York. The essential factors in fighting a fire are promptness of discovery and the speed with which firemen arrive on the scene. To each of these alarms, no less than four pieces of fire department apparatus and two police cars respond with the required speed. But speed has its hazards. As many or more firemen and police officers are killed and injured while responding to alarms as in the course of the fires themselves. An accident while responding to a fire is bad enough. While making a run to a false alarm, it's more than tragic. And during the last year, there were 13,981 false alarms in the city of New York. After a determination was made by the ambulance surgeon that the driver of the car which collided with our automobile was not injured... The ambulance left for Bellevue with patrolman Paul Egan. 
I remained on the scene until detectives arrived from the 21st Squad and the Manhattan East Homicide Squad, which sends specialists to make technical investigations in all serious motor vehicular accidents. Sector car number four came by for me and took me back to the station house. There, Lieutenant Gorman, the desk officer, reported that he had been in touch with Bellevue Hospital in regard to the condition of Patrolman Egan. The officer had not yet regained consciousness and at 6.20 p.m. was still in the x-ray room. I went out for a meal, and when I returned at 10 minutes after 7, I went directly upstairs to the 21st Detective Squad where Joseph L. Creedy, the driver of the other car, had been brought for questioning by Lieutenant Matt King, the squad commander. Is Lieutenant King in his office? Yes, sir. He's in there, Captain. 21st Squad. He's out on investigation. Call back the yes. now. Captain Kennelly. Go ahead, Captain. Hello, Matt. Captain. Mercado? Captain? Captain, you know Mr. Creedy. Oh, yes, yes. How's the policeman, Captain? Did you hear anything? Well, he's still unconscious. Oh, you don't know how bad I feel about this. We all feel bad, Mr. Creedy. Yes. What's your occupation, Mr. Creedy? What'd you say? What do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a, a salesman. What do you sell? Light metal extrusions. What's that? Well, it's parts used by manufacturers in making almost anything, usually aluminum or aluminum alloy. Instead of molding the metal, an extrusion is made by pushing a heated bar through a die. Comes out whatever shape is desired. You know, it's something like your wife does when she, when she makes cookies. Same principle. Is it a New York farm you work for? Oh, no, it's Chicago. I represent them in the middle Atlantic states. That's my territory. You uh, travel a lot? Sir? I asked you if you traveled a lot. Oh, yes, all through my territory. I'm in the New York metropolitan area one week, out in my territory the next. Ever had an accident before? No, nothing serious. I banged up a fender once or twice, getting in and out of tight parking spaces. But nothing where anyone was hurt. I, I drive about 40,000 miles a year, too. I, I travel in my car. Ever been arrested for a traffic offense, Mr. Creedy? Uh, not in New York. Where have you been arrested? Uh, I was given a ticket in Connecticut in uh, Ridgefield uh, once for passing a stopped school bus. I, I thought it had started up again. When was that, recently? $25. I asked when it was, Mr. Creedy. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you asked how much I was fined. It, it was three years ago, about. And that's the only time you were arrested on a traffic offense? I wasn't even arrested then. He just gave me a ticket to the state trooper. You ever arrested on any other occasion for any other offense? No. Never? Never in my life. Not even for another traffic offense? No, that was the only time. Did you see the police car before you hit it, Mr. Creedy? Yes, I saw it. It was too late to stop. I, I tried to, but it, it was too late. Now, Captain, you were proceeding on Lexington Avenue with a siren wide open. Is that right? Yes, it had been open for about two blocks. Didn't you hear the siren, Mr. Creedy? Is that why you failed to pull over and give him the right of way? I didn't hear the siren. You're aware that it's the law that you must pull to the right, stop, and give an emergency vehicle the right of way. Absolutely. Why didn't you do it this time? I didn't hear the siren. Mr. Creedy, a siren is designed to be heard by everyone. I didn't hear it. It's no excuse, you know. I'm not looking for any excuse, Lieutenant. Mr. Creedy, are you hard of hearing? No. You are, aren't you? What gives you that idea? I don't see how anyone could not hear the siren that close to it. Have you ever had any trouble with your ears, Mr. Creedy? You've missed a lot of questions that have been asked you. Yeah, I have some trouble... Uh... Some time. How were you able to get an operator's license? Well, I had the license before I had any trouble. I just kept on getting renewals. Aren't you aware of the fact that the renewal application inquires if you have any trouble hearing, any new physical disability? Yes, I'm aware of it. You failed to tell the truth when you filed your renewal application. Is that right? I hear all right. M most of the time, it's just, just on occasion that I have any trouble or I, or I miss something. It was a pretty big occasion when you missed hearing that siren, wasn't it, Mr. Creedy? Yes, I, I suppose it was. You don't have to suppose, Mr. Creedy. Were you talking to me, sir? <sighs> no, Mr. Creedy. I'm going down to the hospital, man. I'll walk out with you, Captain. Okay, man. I hope he comes out of it all right. If I were you, Mr. Creedy, I'd not only hope, I'd pray that he does. Well, are you almost finished with him, man? Yeah, I'm going to have Mercado book him right away. The man really bought himself some trouble, didn't he? Well, I don't feel sorry for him. He's physically incapable of driving a car. He shouldn't be driving one without wearing a hearing aid. Yes, sir, you're right. How do you feel? Oh, all right. You were lucky to come out of it okay. 
A little bump on the head, that's all. Did it bother you? Oh, I had a headache when I got back to the station house. I took a couple of aspirin. Maybe you ought to have it looked at, Captain. No, it's okay. Yes, sir. You going down to the hospital? Yeah, right now. I want to be back by 10. The borough chief said he might visit the precinct tonight. If there's any change in Egan's condition, will you call me direct, Captain? Yeah, Matt. I sure will. I went downstairs to the muster room where Lieutenant Gorman, the desk officer, told me that the 34th precinct in which patrolman Egan resided had been unable to reach his wife to notify her of the accident. A babysitter told the notifying officer that she had gone to the home of a friend in the Bronx and was not expected home until shortly before midnight. The babysitter gave the notifying patrolman the address of the friend and the 44th precinct was asked to make the notification. Sector car number three came by the house to drive me to Bellevue. Ordinarily, when a police officer is injured on the job, the commanding officer is required to make a complete investigation of the facts involved to determine if the injury was in the line of duty. In this case, I was aware of the facts of my own knowledge, and I entered them into the blotter. At the hospital, it was my intention to see the injured member of my command to make sure he got proper care and to wait for his wife. Patrolman Meister drove the RMP car into the hospital grounds at 30th Street and Franklin D. Roosevelt Drive. He parked the car adjacent to K Building, and I instructed him to wait. I walked into the emergency ward in I building and through the corridor where I saw Sergeant Waters waiting. Sergeant? Oh, hello, Captain. How's Egan? Did you hear? Yes, sir. The district surgeon is here. He told me he saw the x-ray pictures. He's got three broken ribs from where he hit the steering wheel. Oh, what about his head? It's a bad cut. No fracture. Possible concussion. That's why he hasn't come around yet, the way I understand it. Well, what are you doing down here? Well, I was over at the division, officer. I... Thought I'd check on Egan as long as I was nearby. Good. Well, get rolling as soon as you can. Yes, sir. Uh, how do you feel? All right. A little headache before, but I took a couple of aspirin. Feeling all right now? Yeah, I'm all right. Why? I was just wondering. Uh, the district sur surgeon wanted to see you when you got here. He asked me to tell you. Oh, I want to see him, too. Where is he? Down there in the office, you know. Yeah. Oh, uh, Sergeant, would you go out to the car and tell Meister to come in and wait around for Mrs. Egan? I don't want to miss her. Yes, sir. I'll tell him. It's, uh, that little office there, isn't it? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, right past the light there. All right. Yes? Captain Kennelly. Come in. Hello, Doctor. Oh, Captain. How's Egan doing? He'll be all right, I think. He's beginning to stir around some. That's good. Three fractured ribs. The head injury is a possible concussion, but I think he'll be okay. Sit down. Well, uh, I don't want to miss Egan's wife, Doctor. You won't miss her. Sit down. Well, all right. How do you feel? All right. Pretty good. Which? All right or pretty good? All right. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see that bump on your head. Oh, it's nothing. No, then it won't hurt to look, will it? Watch it. Oh, tender, huh? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, it's not bad. No. Wait a minute. What's that for? Nothing. I just want to shine this flashlight in your eye. Uh, look over my right shoulder. And keep looking there even after I take the light away, okay? Why? Captain, do I tell you how to catch a thief? <sighs> okay. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. What's the matter? Nothing. Now, let's try the other eye. What are you looking for? Just look over my left shoulder. All right. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Stand up. Well, what's the idea? Well, we've got to wait anyway, don't we? Come on, stand up, Captain. All right. <laughs> All right, put both hands out in front of you, palms down. That's it. Now spread your fingers. Turn your hands over, palms up. That's it. All right, now back. Well, what are you looking for? You can't find anything until you look, can you? No. All right. Put your feet together. Uh, toes together, too. 
right now, your hands down at your sides. Close your eyes. That's it. Now, hold it there for a second. Hold it there. All right, you can look now. It's just a little bump on the head. Yeah. Sit down, Frank. Look, I'm all right. I know. Cross your left leg over your right. That's it. What are you doing? Testing my reflexes? Something like that. Ah, you see, I've still got a lot of bounce. But you don't know whether it's good or bad, do you? Uh, cross your legs the other way. That's it. I'm okay. There's nothing wrong with me. Okay, now open your mouth and very deeply breathe in and out until I tell you to stop. Now look, doctor. Go ahead. Okay. Feel a little dizzy? No, not at all. Hmm. You should. Excuse me. Hello? Yes? Yes, I see. Yeah, all right. I'll be right back there. Yeah, in a minute. Well, Egan has regained consciousness. Oh, good. Come on. Then you uh, think he'd be all right? Oh, sure. Your uh, headache's gone away? Oh, I uh, took a couple of aspirin. Mm-hmm. Uh, that way, Captain. Captain. Yes, Sergeant. I've got Eisner waiting down at the main desk for Mrs. Egan. Good. He regained consciousness. Oh, is he going to be all right, Doctor? I think he'll be fine. Uh, this way. Yes, you can't be too careful with these cases, can you? That's the point, Captain. We've got to be. Oh, uh, did they say he was talking? Oh, yeah. A blue streak. And he's hungry. Well, that's a good sign. Usually. Yeah, this will be good news for his wife. It sure will, Sergeant. How many children does he have, Sergeant? You know? Two, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, where'd his wife have to come from? Well, they live in Washington Heights. But she was visiting in the Bronx. She was notified there at a friend's house. Mm. It can be an awfully long trip downtown when you hear your husband's been hurt. Yes, it sure can. Oh, doctor. Yeah? Don't they have Egan down there, down that corridor? Yes, but I'm not going there yet. I want to get some x-rays of that thing the captain carries around on his shoulders. Well, I'm all right. What are you talking about? I'm a skeptic, Captain. Sergeant, notify the desk officer that the captain is temporarily out of service. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Wait a minute, just a second. Burglars where? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what is that, an apartment house? Well, did you see them? What? Yeah, all right. Well, don't worry about that. We'll take care of it. No, you stay right there. 21st Precinct, a factual account we'll of the way the police over. work in the world's largest city, is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolmen's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Featured in tonight's cast were Anne-Marie Geyer, Harold Stone, Louis Nye, Frank Marth, and Ralph Camargo. Written by Stanley Niss and directed by Howard G. Barnes. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Art Hanna speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. <laughs>